Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending Center for Bain Restoration's National CME Series. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our president and CEO, Dr. Sanji Block and Paul, who will provide more information on today's presentation and our National CME Series. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Guys, again, welcome, and thank you so much for sparing another hour for us in a conversation we're gonna to have today with Dr. Sean Stewart. A quick word about Center for Bain Restoration. Uh, before we go there, just uh, wanna to touch on some basic uh, reminders. Please mute yourself during this presentation. Again, we are still going through a trial phase where we're gonna make these presentations a bi-monthly event. So two times a month, you will be able to get these CMEs. And hopefully with the, a lot of your feedback that we are getting on a regular basis, we are able to improve upon these conversations every time. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. So you guys keeping your uh, microphones muted is really helpful. Uh, please submit your questions through the, uh, through the Zoom chat. Uh, the more interactive we make it, the better it'll be for everybody. You all will get your uh, CME certificates either digitally or one of our uh, physician liaisons will bring them to you. And if for some reason you don't get it, then please do reach out to us. Again, as I started, your feedback is critical in constantly making these uh, CMEs better and uh, anything you can help us with in how to make these better will be very much appreciated. And you have my email address to send us those. Uh, and, and, you know, I've received some great comments and would love to continue to get some more. You know, uh, Center for Vein Restoration now is uh, almost 90 sites throughout the country, and we owe it to all the primary care doctors, the PAs, the NPs, everybody in the field who is striving to provide excellent care, not just for venous disease, but all around, and especially in this time of COVID. So whatever little we can do to help with education in the field of venous disorders, we have learned everything only through your generosity and graciousness where you have trusted your patients over the years with Center for Bain Restoration. And at the same time, a lot of the invitees are also people who are very accomplished in the field of venous disorders so that we can get a dialogue going. If you have a question, we'll have our own physicians answer that, CDR physicians, which is almost 65 to 70, exceptional physicians now, but in addition to that, we also have the expertise of a panel of people who may not be from CVR, but also have a lot of knowledge. So our goal is to get everybody from these different fields together to provide the best level of education that we can. This is a picture of all the doctors who've made this possible. Uh, education, research, it takes a lot of individual time, we are not a university. So everything that is done on this front is voluntary and just wanted to thank every one of our physicians to put so much effort into education and research. Last but not the least, we'll take a moment to introduce Dr. Stewart. Dr. Stewart is one of our superstar physicians who's been with us for over 10 years now. One of the things that CVR has uh, really, it's our pride and joy, is that we have people coming from very different fields, training in the field of phlebology, going through their phlebology certifications, and ultimately able to provide the best care. As you all know, phlebology has never historically been an independent team. So getting people from various backgrounds, whether it be vascular surgery, be emergency medicine, internal medicine, OBGYN, interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, has turned out to be one of CVR's strengths. Dr. Stewart comes to us from a background of emergency medicine. He, uh, and even before that, you know, I asked him, what are you very proud of? And one of the things, I don't know if he was being serious or not, was that Dr. Fauci, when he did research with Dr. Fauci at the NIH on AIDS, uh, a few times felt, uh, you know, he slept, he was so tired that he dozed off with his, with his head on uh, Sean's shoulders. So, you know, Sean has the shoulders to support 
a lot of brave things. And uh, he's been a professor at Georgetown. He has uh, authored a lot of papers outside of phlebology and within phlebology. And uh, he's our regional medical director of one of our uh, strongest regions. And above all, uh, a great physician with a great heart. So with that, I'll let Sean talk about a topic, which again, you know, why do these things separate CVR from the rest? Clinical diagnosis. If a patient comes to you with leg pain, you know, it's not about just doing an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound is positive, just going, go ahead, treat that. First and foremost, you got to make a true clinical diagnosis. Is this venous insufficiency or what percentage of this pain or discomfort that the patient has is venous insufficiency? And as you listen to Sean's talk, just the depth of that very basic knowledge is going to be exceptional. And I hope you enjoy the talk as much as I have when I've heard Sean talks about, talk about this a few times in the past. So with that, Sean, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for that kind introduction. I'm going to start to share my screen here. Go up to the beginning and let's uh, let's start. Okay. So again, thank you, Dr. Lock and Paul, for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be invited to be part of the Center for Vein Restoration's virtual CME summer lecture series. I kind of joke by saying this is sponsored in part by COVID-19. Um, seriously, though, over the past 10 years, I've had a unique opportunity. I've had the unique opportunity to evaluate adults of all ages who suffer from leg pain and attempt to determine if that leg pain has a venous origin. Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you what I've learned. I'm going to share with you my four fundamental principles of vein disease. We will highlight what symptoms patients experience that are most likely caused by venous reflux in their legs. We'll discuss common venous and non-venous causes of leg pain, and we'll try to figure out if we can discriminate those symptoms that have a, a leg pain due to a venous origin versus leg pain due to a non-venous origin. So let's get started. Fundamental principle number one, venous reflux is common and not all venous reflux requires treatment. Let's go back to the pre-COVID times. Remember those crowded shopping malls on weekends? Well, if I took an ultrasound machine to your local shopping mall and chased all the adults around, I could line people up with sonographic evidence of venous reflux. In fact, one out of four women under 50 and half of women over 50 will have venous reflux on their sonogram. 15% of men under 50 and a third of men over 50 can have sonographic evidence of venous reflux but a quarter of these individuals will never develop clinical signs or symptoms of venous disease. So not all venous reflux requires treatment. Having said that, fundamental principle number two is venous reflux should not be ignored. Let's use the Edinburgh vein study to help illustrate this principle. The Edinburgh vein study was a population-based cohort study from Scotland between the years 1994 and 1996, over 1,500 adults between the ages of 18 and 64 were randomly selected and evaluated. About a quarter of these adults had venous disease at baseline. The majority of these patients with venous disease were actually in early clinical stages of their disease. Over a period of 13 years, nearly half the patients with venous disease worsened clinically and a third of the patients with symptomatic varicose veins at baseline ended up developing edema and skin, dis, uh, skin discoloration over that period of time. As the disease progressed, individuals became more symptomatic and we saw more symptoms develop in women than men. So what we know is that venous reflux is commonly found in adults. Not all venous reflux requires treatment, however, if I'm evaluating a 20-year-old, 
30, 40, or 50-year-old patient in my office with venous disease, I know they have about a 50% chance of worsening without treatment. If I'm seeing a patient in my office with symptomatic varicose veins, I know without treatment, this patient has about a 30% chance of developing leg edema, skin changes, which can put the patient at high, higher risk for ulcerations. So who should we treat? Obviously, patients with skin discoloration and ulcerations can benefit from treatment, but really any patient that develops venous symptoms that negatively affects their quality of life can also benefit from treatment. So what leg symptoms can we blame on the veins? This leads us to fundamental principle number three. Recognize what symptoms are most highly associated with venous disease. In the Bond study, which was published in 2015, aimed to identify just this. The Bond study analyzed data collected from a population-based cross-sectional study of just over 3,000 adults. These adults were aged 18 to 79. Approximately 600 patients with varicose veins and over 400 patients with chronic venous insufficiency. These are patients with leg edema, skin changes, healed ulcerations, or active ulcerations were studied. Patients described all of the symptoms listed on the left-hand side of this slide. They described leg heaviness, tightness in the lower leg, itching, burning, cramping, and restlessness. But the top three were most closely associated with venous disease. So leg heaviness, tightness, and itchy, itching in the leg was most closely associated with underlying venous disease. These symptoms typically worsen as the day goes on. They tend to worse, be worse, I'm sorry, at rest, and they can improve with ambulation. Just like in the Edinburgh study, women experienced symptoms more than men, and overweight and underweight individuals were more likely to be symptomatic. Where in the Edinburgh study, they only studied adults to the age of 64. The Bond study studied individuals up to the age of 79 and found that 74% of those adults over the age of 70 developed symptoms. So now we know that the majority of adults aged 18 to 80 with venous disease will likely develop symptoms that can negatively impact their quality of life at some point in their lifetime. And we know about a third of these patients with symptomatic varicose veins, if left untreated, will develop edema, or skin changes making them more susceptible to venous ulcerations. Let's move on to fundamental principle number four, the pain pie. On average, eight out of the 10 patients I see each day in my office are referrals from other healthcare professionals. One out of every 10 patients I see each day are referred by friends and family who I have treated. So nine out of 10 patients I see each day come to me from a source that has an educated eye regarding venous disease. My recommendation rate for treatments for all patients is about 40 to 45%. Why do I treat less than half the patients sent to me who have a high likelihood of having venous disease? Because not all pain in the leg can we blame on venous reflux. I tell all my patients when we're 10 years old and our leg hurts, it's one thing. But when we're older than 10 and our leg hurts, you have a pain pie. And using this pain pie model, I can best show my patients everything that is affecting the way the leg feels. If the venous insufficiency slice is large, then they should expect significant improvement with treatments. This also helps prioritize therapies and helps manage expectations. This patient in this pie represents or understands, I should say, that the lateral shooting pain, the knee achiness after walking the dog, and the numbness in the toes is not going to improve with venous treatment. But the leg heaviness, restlessness, and edema will absolutely improve with treatment. Since adults typically present with multifactorial leg pain, let's talk about other common causes of leg pain and try to identify ways we can discriminate venous leg pain from non-venous leg pain. Pain can be caused by a problem in the lower back, the pelvis, or the leg. We're going to walk down the leg starting at the back and end at the foot and highlight common causes of non-venous leg pain. 
Since a common cause of leg pain is nerve inflammation or compression of the nerve originating in the lumbar and sacral spine, learning the dermatomes of the legs has helped me better pinpoint the source of nerve-related leg point. Of, I'm sorry, nerve-related leg pain. As you can see from the diagram, as we descend down the spinal column from the L1 to S1 level, this corresponds with descending dermatomes in the leg, both anteriorly and posteriorly. Any inflammation, injury, or compression of the nerves in the lumbar spine can man itself, manifest itself as leg pain. Common causes include herniated discs or degenerative discs, back injuries or inflammation of the spine due to arthritic changes or even non-disease states like prolonged sitting. Radiculopathy of the sciatic nerve is common with a lifetime incidence reported as high as 40%. Taller, older individuals with a physical occupation or an occupation that requires sitting in place for a prolonged period of time, these individuals may be at an increased risk. Overall, the number one cause of sciatica is herniated discs. The sciatic nerve is made up of nerve roots, L4, L5, and S1. Depending on which nerve root is affected really determines the pattern of pain felt in the leg. Compression of the L4 nerve root can cause pain radiating down from the lower back to the level of the knee. And compression of the S1 nerve root can result in pain radiating all the way down to the foot. Usually shooting pain is inconsistent with pain from a venous origin. Pain from a venous origin is often described as more of a dull aching pain. Furthermore, pain from a venous origin is less commonly lateral unless there's associated varicose veins running down that lateral aspect of the leg. Furthermore, sciatica can, can be associated with motor weakness where venous disease does not cause motor weakness. When sciatica-like symptoms develop bilaterally, you wanna think of lumbar spinal stenosis. Five out of every thousand people older than 50 will develop symptoms of spinal stenosis. 90% of the time, the L4 and L5 nerve roots are involved due to spondylosis and degenerative disc disease. Lateral shooting, bilateral pain from the hip to the lower anterior medial distal leg is a common presentation of lumbar stenosis. Thigh pain. All right, to help generate a differential, I recommend breaking the thigh into anatomical regions. And it's easy, you only have to remember three things, nerve, muscle, and bone. This can help narrow down the differential significantly. Let's look at the left side of the slide and use anterior leg pain as an example. The anterior thigh is innervated by the femoral nerve. So any femoral nerve lesion can manifest itself with symptoms of nerve pain anteriorly. Muscle injuries involving parts of the quadricep muscle can cause anterior leg pain. And hip arthritis is a common cause of hip pain that radiates anteriorly and medially in the proximal thigh. So we're gonna run through a, a couple of these common examples of thigh pain. Neuralgia parasthetica. This is the slightly obese patient that loves wearing those skinny jeans, or the carpenter who wears a heavy tool belt all day, or the pregnant woman in her third trimester who comes in complaining of burning pain, tingling and numbness involving that anterior and lateral proximal thigh. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve leaves the spinal column and innervates the proximal leg by running beneath the inguinal ligament. Any pressure on the inguinal ligament can cause irritation of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and cause symptoms in that anterior and lateral proximal thigh. Now this is a sensory nerve, so you don't get any motor dysfunction with this condition. Piriformis syndrome. This is a common cause of posterior thigh pain. This is a sciatica-like pain mimic due to a tight piriformis muscle pressing against the sciatic nerve as it runs through the muscle, thus irritating the nerve. This causes pain to travel up and down the sciatic nerve. This is the patient that comes in who drives for a living or the IT fellow who sits at the desk all day 
And now they're presenting with unilateral tender, tenderness and a dull pain involving the side of the buttocks that radiates down the posterior thigh. In these two examples, patients often describe shooting pains, radiating pain, and sometimes numbness. All of these would be atypical symptoms if the underlying cause was due to venous disease. Now, muscular thigh pain is usually associated with a history of overuse or injury in adults. Muscles and associated tendon injuries or inflammatory processes can present with hip or knee joint pain, or it can uh, present with focal thigh pain. This pain is usually exacerbated by movement and often an upward radiation is felt. Pain due to underlying venous disease usually is not exacerbated by leg movements at rest, and pain that radiates up the leg is usually atypical of nerve pain, which typically radiates down the leg. So we can use some of these characteristics to discriminate on what's going on in the, in the leg. Now, we've all experienced these CME events in the past, and we all know that these CME events are usually much better with good company and good food. Well, keeping good company these days is risky, but I can serve up a virtual lunch. So go ahead and enjoy. Now, if this is making you hungry, I'm with you. This is lunchtime on a Friday, but uh, we're almost done because we've made it to the knee. Now, osteoarthritis is the most common joint disease and osteoarthritis is the most common cause of knee pain in people over the age of 50. It tends to be easy to discriminate from venous pain because these individuals wake up with stiff pain in their knee and that pain tends to get a little bit better as the day goes on, as it loosens up. This pain in the knee may worsen with activity. In contrast, pain from a venous source usually is more moderate in the morning and it worsens as the day goes on. In addition, pain due to re venous reflex tends to actually improve with activity. So ambulation usually helps pain due to an underlying venous cause. Interestingly, osteoarthritis and chronic venous insufficiency share common risk factors, including age, obesity, and a history of prolonged standing. Some studies show venous hypertension, the underlying cause of chronic venous insufficiency, can cause intraosseous hypertension and increase bone resorption. Increased subchondrial bone resorption is associated with subchondrial bone sclerosis and cartilage thinning leading to osteoarthritis. So there's some evidence that exists that chronic venous insufficiency may actually worsen osteoarthritis. In one small study, patients with knee pain and radiographic evidence of knee arthritis with visible varicosities in the vicinity of the knee were studied. 80% of patients reported improvement or complete resolution of their knee pain after varicose vein treatment. We also know that varicose veins can increase the risk for DVT in post-op patients after lower extremity joint replacement. So there may be many benefits in treating venous disease in patients with knee pain from osteoarthritis. Now, not all knee pain is due to osteoarthritis. Actually, the most common cause of knee pain, regardless of age, is patellofemoral pain syndrome also called runner's knee or jumper's knee, because this pain and stiffness around the anterior kneecap occurs more frequently in young people who routinely participate in activities and sports. So the younger female runner with anterior kneecap pain, think patellofemoral pain syndrome. The pain usually worsens going up and down steps, kneeling and squatting. Of note, quadricep tendonitis can also present in a similar fashion. Now, lateral knee pain, specifically in distance runners or cyclists, think about iliotibial band syndrome. Iliotibial band syndrome develops when the iliotibial band tightens and becomes inflamed due to overuse. This irritates the lateral knee bursa and the IT ligament rubs against that thigh bone, leading to lateral knee pain. This um, pain is worsened when we uh, actually do activities that bend the knee. Posterior knee pain uh, is commonly due to Baker cysts. Baker cysts can present with calf pain and swelling. We see a lot of this in our clinics for concerns of DVT. 
especially when a baker cyst ruptures. Uh, knee pain and, and calf swelling. Uh, also think of gastroc tears uh, with pain in the, in the back of the knee as well as swelling in that area. And remember the fluoroquinolones can predispose people to this type of injury. Below the knee, uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit of below the knee pain. Uh, this can commonly be seen in young athletic individuals both due to shin splints or mediotibial stress syndrome, and also chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Chronic exertional compartment syndrome affects runners or athletes under the age of 30, and it presents with bilateral aching, burning, and tightness that starts consistently after a certain duration of exercise. So these people, they say, I can exercise pain-free for the first 10 minutes, but every time that 10-minute mark hits, I start developing this uh, discomfort, these symptoms. It tends to persist or progressively worsen as the exercise continues. But then if you stop the exercise, this pain completely dissipates, usually within 15 minutes of stopping the exercise. Pain typically also is accompanied by numbness and weakness. The fact that this pain is exacerbated by exercise and also is associated with numbness and weakness makes it atypical for a venous cause. The pain develops during muscle expansion while you're exercising, which puts pressure on the stiff fascia that encases the muscle. And that stiff fascia doesn't expand with the expanding muscle. And that's the source of the discomfort. Now, medial tibial stress syndrome, better known as shin splints, causes pain along the medial and distal segment of the shin bone. It's due to irritation of the periosteum and stress on the tibial bone. This usually occurs in individuals that are just starting to exercise and they're really trying to do too much too fast. In rare cases, shin splints can actually lead to a stress fracture. So pain caused by shin splints is usually bilateral, whereas pain from a stress fracture is usually unilateral. Also stress fractures cause more point tenderness focal to the area of the fracture site. Now, shin splints can affect the anterior, medial, lateral, and posterior aspects of the lower leg. Okay, we've made it to the foot. Each foot is made up of 26 bones, 30 joints, and 100 muscles. As a result, most pain in the feet are due to an arthritic process or tendinitis. So just like the thigh, a working differential diagnosis can be made by breaking up the foot by anatomical regions. As you can see here, this is why I love podiatrists. So most foot pain does not have a venous source. However, there's one exception. Parcel tunnel syndrome, one of the causes, can have a venous source. Parcel tunnel syndrome is a syndrome of pain, numbness, and weakness of toe flexion. It's caused by pressure on the posterior tibial nerve as it passes through the tarsal tunnel. Varicose veins causing dilation of the posterior tibial vein, which can compress that posterior tibial nerve, can cause sharp shooting pains, pins and needles, and burning sensations along the plantar surface of the foot. Let's talk about leg cramps. Leg cramps can be a medical mystery. We know that dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, buildup of lactic acid in the muscle, and side effects of medication can all precipitate leg cramps. But we've also all had that patient that drinks a gallon of water every day, eats 10 bananas a day, and is on no medication, who still presents with leg cramps. So think of a, a vascular source, both claudication and venous insufficiency can cause leg cramps. Also, ask the patient to actually describe the character of the leg cramps. A lot of times when patients start describing the character of their leg cramps, the leg cramps may end up being more due to restlessness, myoclonus, or even myalgias, just muscle aches. Now, we've already touched on many sources of exertional leg pain, especially due to muscular skeletal issues like chronic exertional compartment syndrome and medial tibial stress syndrome. However, I'd like to highlight a few uncommon vascular causes of exertional leg pain. In young adults with no traditional risk factors develop arterial insufficiency? Unfortunately, yes. 
two uncommon vascular problems that fly under the radar due to the fact that we see these issues in young healthy adults are arterial endofibrosis and popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. Arterial endofibrosis is actually seen in 10 to 20% of endurance cyclists under the age of 40. And it's due to repetitive flexion at the hip. This leads to kinking and fibrosis of the external iliac artery, causing pain in the leg during cycling. So all you Peloton addicts out there, be careful. These individuals present usually after surpassing 75,000 miles of cycling. Now, popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. This is another uh, uncommon cause of leg pain, and it's due to ischemia uh, with high intensity exercise. Uh, male athletes under the age of 30 who run, play soccer or football are often affected. 3% of the population is born with a defect in their anatomy that causes the calf muscle to occlude the popliteal artery during intense exercise. Another source of exertional leg pain is PAD. Now, keep in mind PAD can present diff in different ways depending on the level of stenosis or occlusion. Also have a high suspicion for PAD in smokers. Smoking can increase the likelihood of developing PAD by 400%. Older individuals, one in 20 Americans over 50 have PAD. So have a high suspicion and a low threshold of considering PAD in your differential when evaluating exertional leg pain because catching PAD early can be life-saving. Part of PAD treatment also involves lowering the patient's risk for heart disease and stroke, which can ultimately save a life. Now, this kind of concludes the meat and potatoes of our CME today on, on leg pain. But um, I, I want to uh, mention that we're going to have a, a few upcoming talks, as Dr. Lockenpaw alluded to. Um, real quick, chronic pelvic pain accounts for up to 30% of our GYN visits in the United States. Chronic pelvic pain potentially can affect up to 40% of the female population at some time during their lifetime. And pelvic congestion syndrome can account for up to 30% of those patients presenting with chronic pelvic pain. So tune in on August 20th when our renowned vascular surgeon, Dr. Peter Pappas, discusses the diagnosis and treatment of pelvic congestion syndrome. I want to thank everybody for their attendance and their attention. I hope I wasn't too long-winded. And I'm going to turn the uh, screen and the mic back over to Dr. Lockenpaul for our question and answer session. Sean, thank you very much. This was clearly one of the best talks I have heard on hardcore symptoms of uh, venous insufficiency and the differential diagnosis. It, it's so important for everybody to understand that when somebody like Dr. Stewart is seeing a patient, all this differential diagnosis is always going in the back of his mind. And that's why if we look at Sean's specific numbers out of 100 patients that are referred to him, he would recommend venous treatments to about 40 of them. And all these are patients who, as he said, have already been seen by a trained guy. And uh, it's just this differential diagnosis, the attention to detail when you're looking at the clinical signs and symptoms and trying to figure out which patient would help. And that's why Sean's uh, NPS scores are upwards of 95%, his patient satisfaction scores. So Sean, I have a couple of questions that have come. Uh, uh, you know, people have texted me the questions directly. I would really like uh, folks to also use the Zoom link to ask questions. But one very basic question, as you see a patient who may be 50 or 60 or 70 years old and has multiple etiologies of the pain that you identify, they may, may be a element of uh, you know, sciatica, there may be an element of uh, some of the other things you've mentioned. How do you tackle that patient as long as there is a significant element coming from venous disease as well? What's the approach you use? So we may be a one-stop shop for venous disorders, but we're definitely not a one-stop shop for pain in the leg. As I mentioned, um, 
when we're 10 years old, that pain is usually one thing. When we're older than 10, uh, these patients have multiple factors that are uh, affecting the leg. So we really need to prioritize uh, these factors. Um, so I, I really depend a lot of, uh, on my orthopedic colleagues, on my podiatry uh, colleagues um, to help address some of these other factors. All in all, taking everything into consideration, if I feel the slice of venous disease is a large slice and I can improve that patient's uh, discomfort by 30, 40, 50%, then I'll usually still recommend treatment. Now, a lot of that is because I have an easy job. My job of treating veins is a whole lot easier than going through back surgery or knee replacement surgery. So with a, a little bit of ambulatory, minimally invasive uh, procedures, I may be able to help that patient sig significantly. Now, if I feel their pain is largely due to a non-venous source and maybe they have a little bit of venous syndrome, symptoms, then we'll prioritize the, and revisit the, the veins at another time. Remember, venous disease is not a life or limb threatening issue. So uh, there's nothing wrong with getting treatment for some of those other ailments that are affecting the patient more significantly and then reevaluating the veins at other times. Compression stockings uh, can bridge that gap. Uh, we know compression stockings we don't necessarily recommend as a treatment modality, but they're good at sl slowing the process down from getting worse. They're good at protecting patients against worsening swelling and, and blood clots in certain situations. So that's kind of how I approach things. So I, I think you bring up the compression stocking issue. And uh, do you also use compression stockings as a part of uh, figuring out whether this is venous to, uh, pain or not? Yeah, so... So, you know, a lot of times when patients come in and if we take a good history and physical and we use their ultrasound findings as an extra tool to help make our medical decision making, if that ultrasound finding really matches what the patient is describing uh, in terms of discomfort in the legs, if they match, usually we have a, a, a good success, uh, good outcomes by treating the veins. But there's sometimes where we're not sure if this is vein related or not. So we do use compression stockings as an extra diagnostic tool in many cases. So a lot of times I'll have my patients wear the compression stockings during the days only for three or four days straight and then forget about them for three or four days, then put them back on for three or four days and then forget about them. If they do this off and on for a few weeks, usually they can better understand the etiology of, of their pain as well. If they come back and say, you know, I really don't love those compression stockings, but I have to admit they really did help, uh, you know, certain aspects of my discomfort, then we can go ahead and better uh, understand just how bad the venous disease is affecting their legs. Thank you. So, Sean, I have a question here from uh, Susan Dundas, who's a PA. And uh, have you ever had people complain of calf foot numbness related to compression stockings? So one thing we have to be careful with, with compression stockings is it, it does put external compression on the skin, which puts more compression on our vascular system. So if we have any patient that has arterial disease, we have to be careful because Yes, this, this stocking um, can compress their arteries and cause arterial insufficiency. The other thing is compression stockings are not perfect. Everybody's leg is shaped differently and it's sometimes very difficult to get a good comfortable fit, regardless of the brand or, or the material of compression that you use. So it's not uncommon that we see bunching of the stocking behind the knee or down by the ankle that can cause uh, numbness as well. So I have, I have seen this. The first thing that comes to mind is I wanna make sure that I'm not causing any arterial insufficiency by using external compression on these patients. So a lot of times we'll send them to get an ABI um, to make sure that they don't have arterial disease. Great, uh, thank you for that. And I have a couple of questions here from Dr. Al-Hassan 
The first question is, do you re recommend physiotherapy in order to treat the underlying condition or would you leave that up to the primary care doctor or whoever you might send that patient to for the underlying disorder? If the underlying disorder it, you know, can be improved with physiotherapy, then absolutely, you, you would wanna consider that. And we do have a lot of older patients that are deconditioned um, and one of the things we see in addition to leg pain is we see leg swelling. And we know that leg swelling can be caused by just sitting in place for long periods of time or um, not having an effective calf muscle pump. So a lot of times some of the symptoms we see do not have an underlying vein cause and actually may not have an underlying um, real pathology. All we have to do is strengthen the patient's calf muscle and get them more active in some of these symptoms like leg edema and some discomfort, uh, especially um, weakness in the leg can be improved with physiotherapy. I hope I answered so, the question correctly. I have a lot of questions that's basically addressing two issues. One is what if in your clinical exam, you identify a patient who has classic pain of venous insufficiency? However, the ultrasound is negative. How do you deal with that patient? And then let's take the reverse, that a patient does not have classic signs of venous insufficiency, but the ultrasound shows rip-roaring reflux. How would you address those two situations? So we see both scenarios quite frequently uh, in the clinic. So the first scenario is a patient who is describing leg heaviness and tightness. They may have some skin changes. So this, this patient, you're convinced they have venous disease and you do the ultrasound and you're very underwhelmed. There's a few things that uh, we think about. One, we think about what time of the day are we seeing this patient? If a patient just gets up and comes right to the office and hasn't been on their feet for a long period of time, they may not have enough time on their feet for some of these dilated veins to develop. Remember, there's two systems of veins in the legs. There's the deep veins in the muscle layers and below. The deep veins are responsible for bringing the majority of the blood up out of the legs against gravity. Then there's a second system of veins in the legs. These are superficial veins. Superficial veins are redundant collateral veins to the deeper veins. The superficial veins lie between the skin and the muscle and collectively they only circulate about 5% of the blood. These veins are right under the skin and they're two, three, four millimeters in diameter. If the patient hasn't been on their feet long enough, we may not see a lot of dilation of these veins early in the morning. The other thing is if the patient is cold, some of these veins may be dilated or not dilated. They may be constricted. So there's certain factors that can, uh, you know, cause us not to, to see everything that's there on, on the ultrasound. So in these cases, I often bring patients back at the end of the day and rescan them. The other thing uh, you have to think about is you have to think about venous outflow obstruction. So the, all the veins in the legs empty all their blood into these large veins in the pelvic um, area called iliac veins. We have a lot of overlapping structures in the pelvis. And since the veins are a low pressure system, they often get pancaked a little bit in the pelvis. A little bit of iliac vein compression is not a life or limb threatening issue. But if that iliac vein is compressed significantly, that puts a lot of resistance on getting the blood up out of the legs and can contribute to venous hypertension. And we can see a lot of the same symptoms and a lot of the same clinical signs in these patients, uh, even though they don't have any varicose veins or any venous reflux in the leg veins. Now, patients that have a really bad ultrasound, meaning a lot of venous reflux, and then you walk into the room and they have no swelling, no varicose veins. They say their legs feel great. Well, this, is, uh, this happens less frequently, but remember vein disease in the legs is common. It's not life or limb threatening. And a, about a quarter of people will never feel it and they'll never see it. So this individual may be one 
that is, that fits that bill. Now, a lot of times, if they have bilateral findings of venous insufficiency, I usually try the compression stockings. Because let's face it, if you have bilateral vein disease, you don't have a good leg to compare the legs to. You don't know what a good leg should feel like. And since this disease is insidious, it develops slowly over time, they may just acclimate to the way that the leg feels. So patients that have a significant ultrasound have underwhelming uh, uh, symptoms. I usually do a stocking trial, see if that doesn't make the patients feel better, and then bring them back and reevaluate them. So Sean, we have a lot of questions here on how do you treat these patients, but I, I think I would like to continue focusing on the differential diagnosis and uh, how do we specifically, you know, make the, a clinical diagnosis. So towards that end, one of the questions that's been texted to me is uh, when you have a patient who has uh, pain in the legs, which you think is very typical of venous insufficiency, the pain gets better when the patient walks around, is pain is there when the patient is uh, sedentary. It, with that particular situation, what is the differential diagnosis that goes through your mind? And, and I think whoever's asking this question is trying to differentiate it from arterial disease where you have pain when you walk around. Uh, can you take us through the algorithm? I mean, you wonderfully presented all the possibilities, but I think what the question is asking for is an algorithm that goes through your mind. Yeah, so if you're trying to discriminate vein disease versus arterial disease, um, there's, there's a few things that you can use. One is, is history. Um, as Dr. Locke and Paul mentioned, vein disease usually improves with ambulation, whereas arterial disease is worse with ambulation. The other thing is clinical findings are different in these two individuals. I mean, obviously individuals can have both going on, but with arterial insufficiency, you usually have some pain and pallor and numbness uh, uh, distally in, in the legs. Whereas with vein disease, we usually uh, get the whole leg feels heavy or tight or achy. You don't, you, they, you know, the, they have good pulses, good capillary refill. Um, so they, their, their foot is not pale. Uh, and with vein, vein disease, it's the number one cause of leg swelling. So uh, with arterial disease, you usually don't get leg swelling. So there's characteristics that can Differentiate, differentiate the disease, and there's also uh, clinical signs that can differential, uh, different the dis differentiate the diseases. That's great. So uh, I will, there's, there's a few questions here on everybody's really, really excited about the quality of your slides, uh, Sean. And we even have uh, Dr. Doughty, uh, one of our godfathers of venous disease, uh, uh, commenting and giving you kudos. So it's so much reason for Thank all you. of us to be proud. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going through the questions as, so for those who are asking for slides, all of our previous and current, and hopefully a lot of future CMEs, you will be able to find on our website. And, uh, you know, for people like, uh, you know, some of the folks who are right from the neighborhood, uh, we will be happy to also put these on disks or USB drives and present them to you, but they're all on our website. One of the questions here is, if a patient has combined CVI and P PAD, uh, how do you, the question is more on how do you treat, but I'll convert that into how do you first diagnose, which you already addressed, and let's go into that. How, which component would you treat first? Yeah, PAD, of course, trumps vein disease. So uh, PAD is uh, limb-threatening. And as I mentioned, peripheral arterial disease can also, um, you know, put patients at risk for strokes and, and heart attacks. So it's potentially the first symptom of a life-threatening issue. So you, our arteries always uh, trump the veins. The veins, even though it's, they're much more common to have vein disease than arterial disease, it's six times more common to have vein disease than arterial disease. Arterial disease is, is much more uh, life or, and limb threatening issues. So you wanna treat that first and then you can circle back to treat the vein disease. 
and we see that a, a, a lot in our clinics. Uh, patients are sent in, um, they, they feel that uh, we can, we're good at uh, diagnosing both uh, venous disease as well as arterial disease. So I see a handful of patients that are suffering from arterial disease, and this, this is the priority for those patients. Thank you. And another question here from Dr. Hassan is about phantom pain. Can it give rise to venous insufficiency? Ooh, I don't know. That's I didn't a, know the answer, so I was like, okay, Sean would know it. <laughs> not, that's, a, that's a good, good question. Um, hey, it's okay to accept, I don't know. So Dr. Hassan, we will look into it and get back to you. We do not have an answer to that question. Well, guys, that takes care of all the questions that you had. And uh, Sean, again, thank you very much for an absolutely spectacular presentation on a topic that is so basic, yet not discussed, because everybody these days, you know, at least when, uh, way back when, when I was going through medical school, the test would be you have to come up with a diagnosis, a differential diagnosis, and then order the tests. And uh, you're only allowed to order so many tests because you're not allowed to waste money. And now, thanks to all the malpractice attorneys, we want to cover every possibility even before we touch the patient. And uh, the whole art of clinical diagnosis is being lost. I mean, that, that the beautiful pain pie that you showed and the, the, the pictures of the knee with different the differential diagnosis right there, I mean, those are amazing, amazing pictures. And we all need to remind ourselves that a major part of this diagnosis should be made, not can be made, but should be made clinically. And then we proceed as to whatever the next steps are. So thank you for an amazing talk. And guys, if you have any further questions that come to mind, uh, please send them to us or your local CVR physician would be more than happy to address them. And as Sean had mentioned, uh, next time we have uh, the absolute world's authority on pelvic congestion, Dr. Peter Pappas, uh, talking about pelvic congestion syndrome. And we'll again make it about a half hour of presentation and half hour of open discussion so that uh, your questions can be answered. Please do join us and uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everybody, for joining.